So um, I'm really, really excited to have you around. And uh, <laughs> uh, Rob's uh, written a number of articles in Nature. Uh, his, his latest book, Biology's Technology, was published in 2010. Is that right, Rob? Yeah. Um, and has uh, sold a lot. It's a great book um, if you want to an intro to the bioeconomy, kind of the newest, coolest stuff, um, as of a couple of years ago, and kind of just where the industry is pivoting and such. Um, and uh, Rob does a lot of consulting and advising for various government organizations. Uh, so, Rob connected and well respected. So, yeah, thanks so much for uh, being here, Rob. So, I don't know, do you just want to start and, and or do you want to open the floor for questions? This is completely ad hoc. So, uh, it's up to you to look at my statement because I was going to send out the uh, YouTube link on Twitter. Um, if you give me one second to do that, and I'll say a couple of words and then uh, you can guys can ask some questions. Maybe what I'm doing is you can tell me if you have any results yet from uh, Nothing yet. So these bacteria are slow growers, uh, but hopefully we'll see something more morning. We're hoping to see something after 16 hours, but Nothing yet, really. Uh, the other thing is we've made some really ambitious DNA. So I think everybody here, you know, not nobody here did the standard like one enzyme or like, you know, A, B, C, D, E. Everyone did like, multiples and very, very complex stuff. So uh, we'll see how it turns out. I don't think it does. Okay. So now the tweets out. Well, I'll go first. This is all started. Uh, so, hope you're nice and warm. It's like a little lodge. I there. Uh, as Justin said, I've been trying to talk about it um, for a while. I'm um, measured at 1 5 um, in the US in 2012. Uh, I just one test that generated about $10 million in revenue, which is a pretty big number. That's uh, about 2.5% of the US GDP. Growing very rapidly, about only two and a half percent of the world is between 2010 and 2012 is actually seven percent of the world's GDP. So, genetically modified stuff contributes far more to the US economy in terms of its growth right now, but actually, consistently, it comes to that makes sense. Um, that's a measure of how much it is, and how much it's contributing to the chain. Uh, that's what we three areas drugs, crops, and material products. We were designing the room, said we were biotech, we should provide the drug for the crops. So it's pretty big. Um, genetically modified drugs and biologics, uh, as we call it. In the US, it was about $100 billion in uh, 2012. Genetically modified crops were somewhere north of about $25 billion. That's a on scale that we need to see. Industrial products, which is fuels and mining materials, was at least $125 million. Um, and that number is business to business uh, sales, so the consumer impact is even bigger than that. And this may just seem like a bunch of numbers, but the point is, I mean, it's ever more important. Uh, it's not measured very well, so that's also important. In North America, there's a system for measuring uh, various states of the economy. Classification system. The glasses and the shoes and the computer, everything that you are sitting in now has a this code, as it's called. There's no base code to provide that. So that makes it hard to assess how much stuff is in the economy in this area. What uh, else do you want to say about this? Um, of the 125 billion, that's industrial products. It's another one to match on. So you can try to work it. Uh, 30 billion is biofuels, which you can check. And then um, the, the largest component is actually chemicals, and that's something I've been expecting to happen for a while. $66 billion is largely uh, unregulated in the sense that the chemicals are you know, basically controlling the current dynamic of the biofuels. It's growing very rapidly. The potential market size there is trillions of dollars, absolutely months. And as we learn to build stuff using biology uh, at lower cost than the economy's controlling, we get ever more of our industrial products from that. Uh, of course, that raises questions about the feedstock farm. You 
Now there's, there's six groups who uh, are going to participate. It ended up, because of the time constraints, we ended up being the only group this weekend. So over the next two weeks, another six and uh, more fallen. So over the next uh, month to two months, there are going to be hopefully 50 or so different groups. So that's really interesting. Uh, again, that's not something that could have happened a few years ago. It's kind of a, a live exchange of information as you're changing, as you're coming to move them, and uh, I'm not really curious about where it's going to go. But, uh, not just this time, because however you guys do with the project this time, the next time, you know, it's going to be different. There's some other people, some other pathway. Uh, and you have to be more this time, you're going to the next iteration. Uh, and collaborating internationally in very unconventional <laughs> Actually, Rob, last. Sorry, I was going to say, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes, I can. 
Awesome. I was, uh, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, on that note, we ended up finishing our experiments in our hotel room last night. So <laughs> it was even more unconventional. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Um, and I can I can say that uh, people on the site order uh, on the security team. We were kind of basically aware that it was possible, but they had no idea that it would be feasible right now. And so it was interesting to watch the conversation between Justin and DHS and uh, some of the organizations around this that the things about that had been around what was feasible. And looking at you there today, uh, it's a long way from 10 years ago when you know, a few hours of rest even though it's completely legal. Right? Uh, and um, that's pretty interesting, right? 10 years is a long time, it's also not that long. It's uh, a pretty cultural shift for something that people will really afraid of every once in a while. Uh, and of course, the core of that story is. Much easier to grasp the fear instead of embracing the opportunity. But what we're doing is embracing the opportunity. And it's really getting that. And it's fantastic. Uh, I don't know, Justin, is there anything else you want me to talk about? Or should we just talk about other questions? Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll ask the first question, um, and then we can open it up more to the floor. So we briefly touched on, I guess, the global economy and how interconnected it is. Uh, I'm sure you've been following the the food versus fuel uh, argument or dilemma for the last number of years. Maybe you could just comment on on what you know about that, and because I remember hearing something about Mexico and uh, people not being able to purchase food because of this. And maybe, maybe you could just comment on that more broadly. Great. Question. Let me answer this a little bit in the way, kind of check out what these numbers are. And uh, I think that there's a lot more fear. We also have to be careful to distinguish between different kinds of products and different kinds of fuels or products. So, uh, for example, sugar going to ethanol, vegetable, um, and so these are really different kinds of markets and really different kinds of uh, growth conditions around the world, growth and market same. And just to take the follow up question, so in 2007, I was running around Asia. Consulting trips, uh, and you know, there's a poem as far as the eye can see flying into uh, uh, the Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. The airplane flies in and you can't see anything but the road or another road. And the same is true train on train. And the assertion was that it was biofuel. And the 
us to say about that. So the Mexico story is really interesting in terms of the word I brought in Mexico at the conferences in 2006, 2007. But that's not because that's not because corn has been turned into ethanol exactly. In Mexico, they generally eat white corn, but it's not white corn that people eat that is turned into ethanol. It's yellow corn. So there may have been some shift of crop corn that was yellow corn to white corn. But it wasn't that big. There was more other issues. Fuel is Everything else about it, all in corn. More importantly, in Mexico, uh, only 30% of farmers have tractors, which means their productivity rates are much lower than uh, other uh, <coughs> corn farmers in North America. Uh, and those kinds of issues turn out to be, I think, more important in terms of constraining food supply than does uh, and this version of those crops. But that said, it's a very complicated story. Uh, it's not something that you can Describe in a simple phrase and just be done with it. You really have to understand what land, what form, where the water comes from, what the fertilizer is, how it gets transported, where it gets turned in, where it's being turned into. All that stuff is required to figure out what the real drivers are, where the real toll is in the market. Great, thank you. Cool, do we have any questions from the crowd? It can be anything, anything at all. That's I have a question and curious to hear your thoughts on it. So we have a, a group interested in purchasing one of these kits in Iran. And uh, just last week, one of the kits that we shipped to uh, the states got held up at the border. And uh, you know, so it's interesting, the idea of shipping a kit to Iran, but also collaborating with the university in Iran with all of the sanctions and the politics that are involved. What are your thoughts on opening channels with you know, conflict countries like this in such a way using the web. That was a little bit terrible, but I'll repeat that to you. <laughs> so it sounded like you said uh, you were interested in shipping kids around, building ties with uh, other people, especially uh, universities in Europe. Did I catch that right? Uh, so, 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 yeah, let me just reiterate. So the question was, um, we have a group, uh, there is a group in Iran that is that wants to buy a kit. Uh, and very recently, actually, Genspace wanted to participate this weekend, but they couldn't because their kit was held up by the border. Uh, and so I guess Pantheo was just asking, what are your thoughts on uh, working with these uh, with these conflict countries or, you know, there's conflict-related to uh, this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah, Iran's kind of next level, right? Like, if it's getting stopped at the U.S. border, you know, what are your thoughts on, on other countries that are a little bit more uh, controversial? This has been a problem for a while with the agents. Um, Justin, I remember this, but uh, some years ago, uh, Brazil, the uh, iTunes team in Brazil, uh, basically was having trouble taking them because the region's inside of Mars, uh, getting them at all, getting out of the border, uh, and it wasn't a domestic supply of the reasons they needed to finish their project. I think the same thing has happened in Mexico from time to time. Uh, and all I want to do with that is say it's not an issue just related to the Chicago case. Um, I have a colleague, uh, Steve Aldrich, who uh, and I are up and work for many years. He's actually teaching a course based on Chicago case and uh, at a school in Cancho right now. His kid was held up before the two years going to a school or high school. Um, so it's not so surprising that he bring this up with uh, the symbiotic group before the hack started um, and ask questions on, around on the side of the board and see if we can make this go faster or something. Um, but they don't know if there's any way to speed up. Uh, and so that's just to say that internationally, in general, this is going to be a problem. Hopefully, it means is that we have to stick a, a buffer on the front and kind of need time to think about solving these problems, allow customers to deal with these things, and allow the kids to get through. I hope that's all it. I don't know. Um, 
certainly in the Crimean Iran or the Syrian or the cities would be pretty stable, not only in the North Korea. Then you're going to be uh, raising all kinds of other issues in one second. <coughs> So that's what you guys said. Um, <clears throat> the barriers that you erected in the name of security around countries like that, uh, I think that when it comes to technologies like this, I think that that actually does more harm than good. Um, some years ago, as you may know, uh, an international consortium of companies and the NIH in the United States. Uh, put together a set of guidelines for shipping DNA around the world for the instance of And the idea was that uh, you would prevent uh, people from having access to sequences that could be pathogens, or you would keep it out of hands of different countries and you would avoid that. And it looks like what happened as a result. Um, this is due to uh, disinfections from a meeting in China last year. And I don't have all the pieces of the story, but my understanding is that uh, a variety of different kinds of companies showed up to a meeting in China last year, which was a lot of trying to understand the landscape for DNA synthesis in China. And there were three tiers. I think I'm so, um, there were three tiers. The first tier, uh, or the outward facing companies that serve the Western markets, uh, and they were compliant with the guidelines of the international portion of the US government. There was another tier within China that was largely inward facing and served the larger companies within China, and they also appeared to be uh, following the regulations of Navy, but the Chinese authorities weren't really that way. But there was a third tier that wasn't clear how many companies were instituted uh, or how big they were or how much they were shipping. It really that it exists that, uh, in which the companies in that third tier exist specifically to fill markets that the, uh, the rest of the world needs to So they're shipping packs and they're shipping um, And the Chinese government doesn't know how many of those companies. And in my experience, uh, the Chinese government also doesn't have a good way to keep track in terms of its companies or how many people have it. Um, this one's up. Sometimes the, the network kicks you off, just uh, uh, quit Wi-Fi and then start it up again. It's getting serious. Hello? Oh. All right, we're back. We're back, yes. Yeah, we're back. Sorry. Uh, okay. I think we, where were we at? Third tier. Third tier. Well, you have three tiers. Oh, okay. You're on the third tier. Yeah, you're just, you're just saying that there was a, a way for the Chinese government to kind of oversee here, and they didn't really know what was going on there. Okay. So, um, so that third tier, at least one of those companies, right, and these are in China, uh, where the people who live in the lab, and it sounds, sounded sort of William Gibson esque, uh, and there are sort of some kind of back alley biotech operation. Um, and if I haven't seen it, I don't know how real that is, but that's how we describe it. Uh, and to, to 
sort of pile on there. A couple of people that are going to go on to the latest biological weapons convention conversation. This was 2011 or 12 or something. Uh, and so it was me and a bunch of ambassadors and diplomats. Um, and after the meeting was over, I pulled the Chinese government side and I said, I shared all this information with you, how to do what the economy is, what the community needs some sense uh, of what's happening in China because I really like to do something better. And he was very honest and said, We have no idea what's going on. We have no means of keeping track of what's going on in the country. We don't know very much about the history of China. Um, and all of that just says to me that. The security measures we think we want to use in this area are probably probably uh, incompatible with national security. Uh, we're used to thinking about gun states and guards as an enhanced group. And uh, I think that actually makes things worse in this case. I think that biotech is a lot more like in terms of the, the, the capabilities of the technology in terms of this type of system. Looks a lot more like uh, drug production and chemistry than it does like nuclear weapons. But clearly, guns, gates, and guards work pretty well with nuclear weapons. And clearly, they don't work very well at all for the work of these drugs. In fact, when you look at uh, what the DEA in the United States says about the impacts of its force methods on the feminists, they were fooling up the DEA that they made the problem worse and much more severe and blacker because of their force methods. So I think we're going to see that kind of thing more and more if we attempt to control access to that. At the moment, uh, maybe it's only the synthesis, but wherever there's a big market in the production technology that are distributed, as biotech already is, then we can't try to control it with, uh, with those kind of hard measures or constraints or fixes, et cetera. Is that a good answer? Yeah, good. Your question? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Please. Thanks, Amari. Okay. So there's a company in the U.S. that's looking to engineer algae to create petroleum. And I was wondering what your thoughts it is in using synthetic biology to create, uh, to replace something you've run out of instead of finding alternate methods to uh, use energy, to create energy from. Just on our uh, so, okay, so there's there are some companies in the states using or uh, engineering algae to create fuels and such. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, using synthetic biology to maintain our current uh, trajectory and our current infrastructure versus changing our society or the way we work, the way we interact with things um, to you know alternative energies, those sorts of things. Great question. Yeah. Complex question, but so <clears throat> um, we could use less, right? Obviously, we could use less. Whatever we talk about efficiency, it seems like getting the 30 percent reduction of use by being more efficient is quite easy in conversation. And just for example, uh, after 2011, when we were having the security conversation in the U.S. about oil, etc., we could have decided at that point to require that in 10 or 15 years, cars be the equivalent to European uh, uh, efficiencies. We could have done that 15 years ago, 13 years ago. We chose not to. Well, 13 years is actually a lifetime of autonomy to replace most of the cars. So if in 2001 we decided to really want to look at the fuel system, we could have our fuel use almost in half uh, already. Um, you know, we could use more electric cars in the city if it makes a lot sense. Uh, if we had cars that had a charging brick instead of mechanical brick, we would waste all that energy. That's about 25% change, which is a lot. Uh, you know, the, those kinds of conversations uh, can go on and on. There are many examples that we can use less. Without actually changing our lives too much. Uh, but at some point, you have to get your stuff in some bigger thing. And the folks in me, if I dice up the transportation fuel usage in the US 
Questions? Kevin. Uh, so, when it comes to picking up a new team, but uh, about over delivering and or over promising and under delivering uh, companies and like if you think about startups that are coming up now where they, um, you know, in a sense, like moving investors instead of investing it now, maybe since startups that started five years ago, even if things like the tries and didn't work out, so they're going to be like a weird topic where some of the people talk about something that's right on you because of this issue. Or I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So, the question is what are we going forward or is it, is <laughs> is there uh, a. <laughs> is, is, yeah. is that hype going to damage and the investment moving forward? Uh, I guess that's it, right? Yeah. 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 
Yes, uh, simple answer. Uh, so, for example, one of the basic things right now is uh, our shadow is something that will enhance or by solar sun, actually, the solar sun is a great company, but it's misunderstood. Not that they made any promises that they would live up to, but that many people set out solar sun that aren't accurate, but that were somehow in the story of solar sun. Amos made a lot of promises which did not make deliver on. Today, Amos is fantastic. That is an amazing engineering and uh, um, production pathway to set up in there. They're time from an idea on an app into a product and put it to Brazil to now 18 months, which would be 10 years. Um, I, all of that's great. The story is derived from 2004, 5, 6, 7, when black people can change the world. It's going to be fantastic. And obviously, it can work out. Um, so the hype is impacting, I think, my experience and that one. So there's capital and we want to set up wild stars. Um, I don't think that there are a lot of companies that are who uh, are really going down the toilet because they misled people. I think that the problem was really hard at people and it's fantastic. There's another piece of this, of course, which is not the public company, it's the venture capital. The venture capital and its investments and the kinds of returns that venture capital will uh, synthetic biology was always going to take a long time to come to market. Everyone came to market. You look at automobiles and airplanes and electricity, everything. There's a long, uh, there's a long adoption period for new technology. Um, but the way venture capital works, they require that you have a certain amount of years, you have to be low, you have to be big returns, uh, regardless of whether the technology is close or not. It's just a business model that requires the big returns. The only way that a venture capitalist investing biology could possibly see the size of returns that they needed was to make it about fuels at the beginning. Uh, and that was, of course, the worst possible market to go after, as I said already. The biggest, that is my market in the context, not what you want to do right here, but a new technology that's just coming out of the garage. Um, we're going to get over it, it's fine. There are companies out there that are making stuff and selling stuff. Uh, and I don't know over the long term whether the biofuel story, biofuel is one of my story, will have uh, changed the overall trajectory how much or not. Uh, if you talk to people at Amherst now, they say that um, they required that much capital and they required the exercise of trying to get into the biofuel market in order to build out their research. So that they may think that they couldn't be the company they are today without having to do that. That's a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know that anybody's done the experiment the other way, focusing purely on small markets uh, with higher level products. Uh, or at least it's been, it has as much exposure as it has So I know that companies out there today who are doing it are more successful. Uh, it's just going to take some time for the stores to get out. That narrative to, to change. Okay. Maybe we'll do one more question and uh, give you some rest, Rob. Any questions? Uh, Great. Hi. I'm curious to know about your thoughts on recent efforts towards de-extinction and if you foresee any economic impacts of that type of resurrection. So what is the progress on the extinction of the U.S. assuming that not Is that right? Yeah, your thoughts on the extinction. My thoughts, okay. Well, so, uh, as you know, I was in the meeting last year, uh, a month ago, so at Cambridge, um, the World Wildlife Conservation Society, the first part conservation biologists together, the uh, biologists asked what the two sides would run from each other, off to each other. The extinction was definitely one of the things we talked about. Um, it's possible that uh, the extinction could be amazing. Um, you know, I Stuart Brand is a very compelling thing. As Stuart always does, he has this phrase, there are holes in nature. You fill those holes in nature. We're going back to, to, to drive down, to extinct. 
distinction. Um, I'm not sure that's what I want to say for this. Um, there are other ways that are economically valuable right now to require real quality and healthy So for the SBs, which are the real health box disorders, Security, or I attempted to grapple with some of these questions. Uh, 
And of course, you can think about um, you can think about the economic impact of the basic species, which is quantifiable in some ways. Uh, and ask you what happens if we accidentally create the basic species due to our frustration of this. What are the impacts of that? And all I can say is we have screwed that up before, and those three just are not screwed up again. But at the same time, we may not have a choice but to start doing these studies. So that we can uh, recover our ability to have a pollination. Thanks, Rob. Well, uh, this was an absolute pleasure. And I think, well, why don't we give Rob a call? <laughs> Maybe we can move over to the fire. You're going to use the uh, projector? Probably um, HDMI, right?
Um, So 
Fireside chat is um, is has been my interaction with uh, government interests in 
the synthetic biology community at large. So it all started, um, I guess it was the summer of 2011. I got an email from this guy, uh, Joseph P. Jackson. And Joseph P. Jackson's a cool dude. Uh, he's from Texas. He's got huge muscles, huge muscles. He used to be a bodybuilder. Yeah, he used to be a bodybuilder. And he's still pretty ripped. Um, I've seen him with those, uh, you know, those uh, whatever protein shake uh, containers. Um, you might have had in the arena. I don't know, but not. Um, but so Joseph P. Jackson was one of the uh, co-founders of um, BioCurious, and I actually met him in the summer of 2011 when uh, my friend who I met at SU, Derek Jacoby, who's from DC, uh, it was like the third or fourth day of being at Singularity University. He said, oh, have you heard of biohacking? There's a, there's a biohack space here that's just getting off the ground in the garage. Come with me. And I had not uh, heard of this kind of thing before. Anyways, he took me to this house in this garage. Uh, uh, and Joseph P. Jackson was there. Uh, welcome, everyone. He's like, hey, check out BioCurious. We're just getting set up to record a video for our Kickstarter, which ultimately, I think they raised 30 grand, which allowed them to pay for rent in a, in a real place. But before they were in a real place, they were in uh, like a one-level bungalow house in Mountain View, California. It looked kind of like the um, house in the movie, the Facebook movie where Zuckerberg lived and was doing all the hacking. It looked very similar to that. No pool, though. But what, what they lacked in pool, they had in uh, coolness in the form of, of a cube truck. <laughs> parked out right front on the front uh, driveway, and inside the cube truck had some of their more interesting uh, bits of equipment. And they also had stuff in the garage as well. And I thought, okay, they had the stuff in the cube truck because it was cleaner than the garage. And that was like their makeshift clean room kind of thing. And so, so we got to chat and whatnot, and then finally I asked, like, oh, so you guys had this cube truck, you have your stuff in there because it's cleaner. And he's like, no, 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 it's in case you know, we get word that the place is going to be raided by the FBI uh -huh. or whoever, the cops or whoever, they can pack up the cube truck and drive it away so that it doesn't get mm -hmm. confiscated, you know, in the, in the time where they're able to prove that they're not doing anything bad, they're not breaking any laws, uh, so they wouldn't have to have that stuff confiscated. And, and uh, I never had thought of anything like that before. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've been involved in software and hardware hack spaces, like in Toronto, there's hacklab.to, for example, and my background is in you know, uh, corporate and uh, university hack lab type places. And we never had to worry about any of that stuff. Um, and so I found it to be interesting. And then, so I think it was a, a year later, or, or a year and a half later, I got an email from Joseph P. Jackson saying, you should come to this event. It's called the FBI DIY Bio Meetup. And that was basically, <laughs> that was all, that was basically all the information. Um, and I emailed him. Tell me a bit more about it. I said, well, I don't know too much, but basically the FBI is uh, renting a you know a hotel space for a weekend, and they're inviting all the DIY bio people from not only the states but from around the world, uh, just so it's like a meet and greet. And uh, basically that's that's what he said. And, and so I asked a few other people, like, okay, well, what's this about? Should I be frightened? Should I not be frightened? I, I just had no clue. And uh, a number of people said, well, just just go. Like, you, if you're invited, you can't not show up, basically. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so I went. And, um, and it was funny because on the way there, so I caught the airplane in Toronto. And there it was like a medium-sized jet flying from Toronto to, I guess, about we were flying to San Francisco, and they were taking the train to Walnut Creek, California, which is where the hotel was. And um, the plane didn't have that many people on it. And I sat beside this guy. <laughs> Um, about my age, and he's just chatting. He's like, oh, what are you up to? You know, I'm like, I don't know, I'm going on this crazy thing to Walnut Creek, like this conference. He's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so what do you do? I'm like, uh, software, <laughs> software, kind of, kind of, I guess, a bio software. He's like, oh, you're going to go meet the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's like, me too. <laughs> and, uh, so his name, was, his name was Chris Constable, and he was actually a member of the, uh, of the just freshly started uh, DIY biospace in, started originally in Victoria, BC. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it started by Chris Constable and Derek Jackie. It's now in Vancouver. Anyway, so we flew there, and the next day we signed in. Actually, um, 
got a hotel at a motel down the street just because I was paranoid uh, about what was going on. Because I, I had no, like, there was no invitation package. There was no, I'm sure they also bought that hotel. What's that? They also bought that hotel. They know. And anyway, so so we went, uh, and basically the, the first day we had the, the welcome, and they had a number of, uh, they had a, um, an agent uh, from the FBI, his name was, it's on my computer, my computer's being used for this, so I'll, I'll get it for later. Um, but he welcomed everybody, and he was wearing the, the, the suit that you expect an FBI agent to wear, like, uh, like Will Smith in Men in Black, basically. Um, and he was relatively quiet. Uh, but you know, welcoming, and uh, and there was a lady there from the Department of Defense as well, and she was very welcoming. And they gave us a um, an itinerary of the next two and a half days. This is what we're going to do. It's actually kind of very similar to the event that we're having here, where we actually at that event we built the Chinook Cockpit. That was the first time I ever built the Chinook Cockpit, and people from the DoD and the FBI participated in having the jet space, and we had an opportunity to. You know, work together and commiserate and talk with each other about you know what their perspectives were on the on the DIY bio community. Um, and of course, going into it, um, I had a chance to speak with other DIY bio members saying, "Oh my God, what are we all about? Are we going to get arrested?" And people were like, "I don't know." <laughs> uh, you know, don't bring your laptop or whatever. Don't bring your phone. And um, but it wasn't like that at all. And and really, what it was was an opportunity for. Uh, information sharing going both ways. So it was an opportunity for the DI, uh, for the FBI and Department of Defense people to understand, first and foremost, I guess, who was self-identifying as a DIY bio person, um, who uh, uh, their connections were, and what their capabilities were, and what our perspectives were on uh, if we put any effort into thinking about safety and security, and if we had ever encountered somebody doing something uh, fishy, and if we had even thought about the idea, if we encountered somebody doing something fishy, what would we do? Who would we contact? Do you call the police? Do you call the hospital? Do you call uh, Hazmat? Uh, who, who knows? They they wanted to know what we knew, um, which was exciting because, to be honest, uh, I had not thought of that up until that point, and up until that point, I hadn't been very active in a DIY bio situation that actually had a lab component like we have here today. It was strictly software because I mean my background is, is computer and software, um, and I'm interested in DIY stuff because it seems like you know, it's like software. And uh, so you know, it really raised the question for me. I was like, oh yeah, I guess these are things that we have to think about, which is really different from computing because you know when I go into a computer science lab, there's no um, uh, a poster on the wall with phone numbers to call <laughs> in case somebody downloads a stolen movie, you know, right? Like. It's not that big of a deal, um, um, and and really no one even is worried about even hacking or things like that. It's just maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't happen, but it's not something that people really care enough about to make a, a, a big show about it. But but that wasn't the case with the DIY bio, um, and so so day one we sat down, they gave us a, a booklet, and there was a bunch of talks from the FBI and the Department of Defense, and I guess probably the driest thing was. Um, a almost like a case study of scenarios where uh, the, the FBI agent would stand up and say, "Okay, case study number one. Uh, there's a DIY bio lab, and you're managing it. And uh, a new member comes, and, and uh, uh, they're asking about all this stuff. Like they're asking about the tuberculosis, and they're asking about things that are harmful that wouldn't be." Generally interesting to the DIY community, certainly for a beginner, maybe for an advanced person who actually was trying to come up with a cure or a sensor for something like this. Um, but so they were they were setting up actually like okay, it was a suspicious situation. What would you do? A nothing. B uh, call um, the FBI agent's number that we're giving you right now. <laughs> C, uh, uh, you know, Join up with this person and try to learn more. Uh, and be, you know, uh, order pizza. And, and it was like it was, it was literally like a multiple choice thing, where it was obvious the answer that they were soliciting that was the right answer. Um, but it, it, it wasn't 
frightening or anything like that. It was just like, okay, uh, it seemed really straightforward. And, and at the end of that, they're like, okay, well, you know, they were admitting, saying, okay, yeah, this is really straightforward. And you know, at, you know, dealing with biosecurity is not something that uh, you should consider to be difficult. It's something that is easy to do in terms of you know keeping your wits about you, thinking about okay, why would somebody be working in this space? Then that you know, can only be doing that at a large company or a university or something like that. Um, call call this number or you know gather some more information about this person just to verify that okay, you know, they're a professor or something like that. Um, and then uh, so so that was that was pretty straightforward. And then we had. For members of the DIY bio community to introduce themselves, give a little talk about what they were doing in their labs. And so there were representatives from Canada, United States, South America, Asia, Europe, um, nobody from Russia, uh, nobody from the South Pole. Um, but basically, there was probably 40 people from all different regions. And it was interesting to see the, um, the the vast difference in capabilities between groups that self-identified as DIY bio. Um, some of them were self-identifying as DIY bio, but really they were um, journalists. They weren't doing any biological work at all. They were just covering biological work and in an attempt, I guess, to learn more for themselves. All the way ranging from groups like uh, La Fayasse in France, um, who had an active uh, basement squat DIY bio lab that was Stuff, although they weren't working on symbiotic because that's illegal, which was not new information for me. Um, and then we had a chance to meet with um, the Department of Defense, and they were basically giving a, a very short speech talking about saying, We love what you guys are doing, we love what the DIY bio movement is doing. Uh, and they gave a little context and a little bit of history. They're like, You know, the computers that you guys are using right now uh, were military technology, they were developed as something in World War II to break uh, uh, encryption codes. And the internet that you used to communicate was a military tool that was used to allow people to communicate even in case of a catastrophic event. Um, you know, there are so many things in our lives that start out as something that was something from the military, whether it was offense or defense. And, and they kind of alluded to like, okay, well they, it's their uh, expectation or understanding that sort of some of the, the bio stuff that they've been working on for a long time is like trickling down to regular people. You know? And they're excited to see the kind of stuff that comes out of that. Um, and they were saying, don't worry, we're not, we don't see you guys as a threat. We see what you're working on is as fantastic. And in fact, we need more innovation in this space because groups like uh, the Department of Defense are banking on um, uh, you know, radical advances in this space. So for example, one of the projects that they're excited about is um, like a, a, a way to develop a biofilm that films on tanks and uh, aircraft carriers and big, huge um, iron and metal assets. So when they build an aircraft carrier, they build it to last for 50 years. And through rust and wear and tear, it, it has to be decommissioned at some point. But if they could have some sort of biofilm that would uh, you know, make it even more rust resistant and more resilient, they could for 150 years and cut the cost in half. So it's something that they're really excited about and they think that that kind of development will come through uh, mass adoption of this technology, getting a lot more people thinking about it and creating an economy that makes it so that people like us can build a business and build a life around you know, developing this type of technology for, for all different reasons. Um, and then I guess finally, um, just before this event here, uh, Rob Carlson uh, introduced me to uh, a guy from the Department of Homeland Security, and from what I understand, the Department of Homeland Security does not have any opinion or voice any public opinion on DIY bio um, and the idea of, for example, shipping kits like this over the border. And uh, I had a 90-minute talk with them last, the, the week before last Friday, so a week Friday ago, and, and it was it was really interesting because it. It seemed like they had not had any contact with the DIY bio community in, in relation to like the FBI people. Or they, they seemed pretty knowledgeable about Florida. The, the DHS people initially were seemed kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say worried, um, and I don't want to say threatened, 
but they asked me, like, is, is this kind of stuff a threat? And, uh, you know, I said, no, I mean, for, for all these reasons, and, if, you know, I'll put you in contact with the people in the FBI, you should check with them. Uh, and and here, they have the same list as me. Um, and by the end of the night, even the conversation, they were pretty cool and wanted to uh, learn more about how they could reach out. So it seems like um, there might be uh, future funding opportunities coming from these groups, uh, in the same way that DARPA offers funding opportunities, even people that aren't American. So actually last year, or two years ago, DARPA offered a project called the Cyber Fast Track, which was um, a granting opportunity open to anyone in the world, could be from anywhere, and you submit a proposal, and inside of five or six weeks, they would give you an answer and a bit of money. And what was really cool was it was even open to people that wanted to release their, whatever their product was or whatever their research was, to release it open source. It was just a pure funding thing to advance the state of the art. Um, and I mentioned that to them, and I mentioned to the FBI that we should do that for uh, the DOI platform, because that would be great. There's a lot of cool ideas from them. Uh, one of the limitations is, well, it has been tools, but the community's done a really good job in creating new tools and developing expensive uh, uh, ways for us to do what we want to do. Um, but the next step is, you know, doing even more research, in-depth research, or bringing something to the market, like a, a product and that takes money. Um, and so if, if they were to offer funding in the same way that DARPA did, I think it would go a long way to minimize the DOI lab community. Um, but I think at the same time, it could um, drive a stake between the DIY bio community in, in the same way that a stake has been drawn through um, like the InfoSec community in, in computers, where there are people that choose to uh, you know, take money or ally themselves with governments and use that kind of government work for some people to working for the man, I guess you could say, versus other people that are more pure, I guess, that don't take government money. Um, so I think that that might be something that we'll see happen in the uh, bio community in the next few years, perhaps. Um, and I don't know, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but I think um, in the computer community, a lot of stuff has been kept secret, certainly for computer security. And, you know, DIY Bio has a really strong open source um, background, um, more so than the computer security community does, uh, in my opinion. And so I'm interested to see what happens if the government, whether it's the government or the American government or the European government that offers these kind of support, well, not just government, but the defense, um, offers this kind of financial support, but then still allows people to use the open source. Uh, we'll see what will happen. I think that, that that's basically been my experience with defense uh, in the States. Uh, we've had no contact with those from Canadian defense or anything like that. Uh, I don't even know if Canada has. Uh, but it's just been in the past few weeks that we actually did make a connection to the Canadian government, and it was the uh, public health agency. So in Canada, the people that are interested in the DIY you know, <coughs> what's happening is the public health agency, uh, which I think is interesting um, because you know their mandate is purely to keep people safe and healthy, whereas you know the FBI, I, I guess their mandate is. To but it's both people, some people. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, any anger that will go to that. But I just think, I think it's it's telling uh, that Canada that we just play the open source. And they're, they're just getting started. Um, I think, like, it's just been within the past eight months that the public health agency has taken on this responsibility. And they're just getting they're just getting started and getting educated. And it's up to us in Canada, the DOI platform, to maybe reach out to them and introduce yourselves and say hi, this is me, just so they know what's going on and that we're cool people and that it's probably in everyone's interest for us to work together because ultimately it's these people in the public health agency that are going to be chatting with like the higher ups in the government and the higher ups in the government are going to be the ones to create laws in Canada. So I would like to see laws get dark. Did, did they, the FBI in particular, did they mention the UK is in government freedom? Do you know the story? Uh, because uh, what they would have been doing with the 
the software community might also be related to that story when they just fucked up. You know? So yeah. maybe they want to repeat that. What so they, they mentioned? The, the, oh, they did mention it for sure. And I think that the DRS. Because they never said, never said sorry. sorry. No, no, they, they, they didn't publish anything like that. But I think that the FDI DRI file meetup was an effort to create these ties so that they know what's going on so that they don't do something like that again and make themselves look bad. Because ultimately, you know, the, the, the people that we met, the they were scientists. They weren't. Um, they were like police agents. You know, that I, I guess they probably had a gun somewhere in their car or something like that. But they, they were they were trained scientists. Um, that was their background. They had PhDs, um, and they're excited about synthetic biology. And they're excited to see this uh, come out of you know expensive labs and get into broader use because that's when things start to get better. Um, uh, so so you know, at least the people we spoke with. Same with the people. They, they did mention the case. They did, they did mention the case, and, and that was the first time something like that's happened. So it actually happened um, in computers. So in the early 80s, there's a guy named Steve Jackson who made board games, or not board games, but like, uh, like Dungeons and Dragons type uh, role playing games. And he made a game in the early 80s that was, instead of uh, wizards and dragons fantasy, it was uh, a freakers and hackers fantasy. Um, and the FBI raided this guy's office and took all the stuff out because I think that was the Secret Service actually, wasn't it? Was it yeah. Secret Service? Yeah. yeah. But that he was Same raided idea, and they, they took all the stuff because they thought he was producing uh, uh, you know terrorist manual. And you know, that's not good for the people. Uh, what was it? I know that there were you said that there might be problems with the community with some, some groups collaborate with, with fences or whatever. But was it visible that there were already problems with the community in those meetings? You know, for example, I know that in Europe, some people was, was, was due to rest of the meeting and they were pissed stuff and they started fighting with, with the meeting groups. Because it, 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 in, in Europe, I guess that some with the software bio local communities are more tied to like radical politics, like the detector underground or more like space and so on. So those people were. Was that feasible at all? Um, I didn't get that feeling. Um, the, the, the person who was um, probably the, the most uh, independent member of the DOI bio community that was probably the most skeptic was Denise Tara. She travels around the world, um, hanging out at all different hacker spaces, not just DOI bio, but just hacker spaces in general. Um, and that was the first time I met her. Um, and she asked some of the best questions. Um, but you know, at, at the end of the event, Everyone left feeling like, okay, well, even if you're the kind of person that is not interested in working with or aligning yourself with the government, it's probably a good thing to go and and know who these people are and know what they're up to and know what they're thinking about, versus staying in your basement and coming up with conspiracy theories and, and making yourself into a friend of the I So that is it's being the absolute opposite of their their desire and need for secrecy for that organization to operate, like the FBI and the government to operate, where, where we are embracing as much transparency as possible and open source. Um, and 
so that's why. So, so when Symbian first started, um, we actually got support from the Mozilla Foundation, which has that support program, which is uh, it's like an incubator or an accelerator. They don't give you any money, like Y Combinator or anything like that. Um, what they do offer is access to their uh, offices that are around the world. Offices that are in the and, but, but the most important thing was access to the Mozilla community. And so, of course, Mozilla is probably the most trusted name on the internet in terms of open source and privacy and transparency. And uh, it was at that time that we actually turned our project into a company. And we really tried to model ourselves uh, as, you know, following Mozilla's lessons and models as much as possible. So that's why a lot of the stuff that we do is open source. Uh, like, for example, our Zoom name design tool, uh, Gentle, is open source. Uh, it's been open source. It comes from a long line of open source tools. And that, you know, I think that speaks to one of your questions of, like, how do you know people aren't inserting malware into your final protocol? And, I mean, it's up to the community at this point. We've made the tools to allow people to engineer DNA. It's up to the community to inspect this code and make sure that we're not putting bad things in there or other people aren't putting bad things in there. to the community or in terms of access to the technology? Well, access to the community, but also the knowledge base. Right? Well, I, th I think, you know, the best we can hope for is bi-directional, because historically, it's been, um, it's been one way. They've had oversight over us. Um, and if we, as a community, you know, continue to embrace open source with each other, um, and to only deal with other people that also are embracing open source, that could be Social contract that the DIY or that the DIY community has. And in fact, there was a, um, I guess it was a manifesto. There was one from written by the American DIY community, and one written by the European DIY community. They were generally the same, but slightly different. Uh, but openness and transparency were a key part of that. And you know, I don't have answers. Nobody has answers yet because it's it's an evolving thing. But I mean, I mean, really, for for anything, for for anything to do with defense, whether it's whether you're a government and you're involved in defense, or you're uh, an individual involved in defense, or you're a community involved in defense, one of the key things is vigilance. You can't ever uh, not uh, think about, OK, what could happen? What is this uh, step that I'm taking now? How could that have repercussions? And so that's really hard to do, to always stay vigilant. And unfortunately, governments have a lot of money, and they have a lot of employees that, OK, one person can't go back for a bit, and the other guy remains vigilant like a, like a, like a rotating uh, center. Like we, we need to be able to support each other in that same kind of way. And I don't know exactly how that's going to happen, but talking with each other is the first step. Uh, Hi, do you have any sort of vision of the future? Do you have any sort of vision of the future?
on. There's just not by the way to say we want to go home with you for the second flight. Put it on your skin, you take it down, it burns your skin, and your bloodstream, and your lungs, and lungs, and pops it up, and you swell on the front of your chest. Kind of amazing, actually, not the way I want to do it, but people with autoimmune disorders are protected. So, um, so I guess the reason why I bring up this story is because here's an example of kind of DIY biohacking um, that had some regulatory action taken against them. And now what's interesting is that the reason why I wrote the story is because I'm a the film station and they have just started clinical trials for the European pig um, parasite use, which I found out a year later had been pulled. So meaning that they, it doesn't even work, right? So all this warm stuff is like, you know, they put them on here. So the point is, is that at some point, what we're doing today is going to have to enter some sort of independent plot, right? What is going to happen then? Well, I don't know. There, there's, there's some cool things like, for example, um, there's a product being run by Pharma and companies called Organovo to develop um, the, uh, organs that you know, right? Like basically, to yeah. grow organs. And that's an interesting opportunity to test drugs that allow you to get ready for a single drug that's making a living free being for that kind of end of heart. Yeah. Um, that's something that doesn't really exist right now, but it's in the pipeline and it's still a promising opportunity. But I think the thing is, like, the more people involved in the UI file, because that's confusing, we went from being limited to hardcore PhDs to basically everyone, the file can go the same way. That means that more people are going to have a broader education about biology. And as a whole, uh, human herd is going to have a better understanding and will be better equipped and better informed to make um, decisions that. Uh, that are impactful. So we maybe the FDA will become even more useful because people that work there will be smarter or more informed, or maybe there will be some other regulatory line in that way. But it's but it's like, just a quick jump in, like just moving towards the first slide, that and the FDA is all geared around uh, like the magical scenario where only one solution uh, saves lives, right? And that's what the harm is that that's what you know, the FDA from the worms or whatever you're talking about. Um, there's going to be a lot of self hacking, and it's interesting because it's not regulated. People can do that themselves. Yeah. And as long as that information is served and shared and uh, the understanding moves forward, then I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. Like, there's somebody with an autoimmune disease who right? I'm all pro. Like, go for it. Like, do whatever you can. Yeah, but. Uh, like, so it's own value. Yeah, but like in retrospect, like from a physician standpoint, right? The guy who self infected himself with, you know, worms, the clinical problem is proof that it worked, right? So, in fact, if anything, he's done potential harm to himself. And it was something called the placebo effect. I mean, if I gave you any, right, if I gave you a sugar pill, you know, 60% of it, 80% of it would be like, I feel better, right? And so that's the danger, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't, you know, you can't just say, hey, you know, just go for it, because everything. But everything you don't do also has a risk. Yeah, so I, I don't know this if I answered. This is a really good point, and this is, the question really is directed at how do we, because we're actually really good at developing potential drug solutions with the economy and system right now. We've got hundreds of drugs just waiting for clinical trials, but we have the money to test them. Yeah, and, and I think that's so there, I, I saw a TED talk the other day that addressed this particular problem. There is a guy, an economist from MIT who developed a
Very inviting in the sense that you know it's 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 unintimidating, or, or rather, even if you don't fully understand it, you feel more welcome entering. Sorry, say that again. Inclusive. Yeah. Possibly, <laughs> <laughs> If you can afford the tools to do the research and how all things are doing, and then you look at it, but you can't really participate to feel yet. We're working on it. Yeah. It's what we're doing here. We're working. But as it as it stands today, you can really participate in real discovery because it takes a lot of time and planning. Um, I agree. I would say, for example, compared to computers, compared to learning a programming language, that's very easy. Go to internet to learn programming. Not like not, not well, me. like the access, the access. Java, C plus plus, C sharp, everything's there on the internet. You have tutorials, you have examples. You can get help easily. With biology, you need tools. Even if there's a lab available, you still have to membership. You still have to invest time, and you have to invest a lot more time in order to learn things. So it's in that way, it's expensive both. First of all, on the wallet, and second of all, in time. So, um, well, thanks for building this. Our, our idea of what open science or open science means. Uh, so, the only negative objectives here were related to like technical problems like nutrition, right? Difficult to access land, it's difficult to have the skills to study uh, for, for decades in order to be able to do something relevant and so on and so forth. Um, I also wanted to add like something like more related to my job, which is more or less to be a sociologist of science and sociology of media, and go back in history and see see whether maybe open science is also very annoying uh, and very uh, difficult to enact. Not because just of the technical threshold, but also because of the social contact of science. And how science is built, it's its own its own world, its own ways of, of working, and so on. Uh, so this is the object that we all know, uh, the Journal of Molecular Maple Syrup. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a journal article. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's published by Moon Shadow Weiner, of course. <laughs> it's an impact factor of 500. Yeah, no, what I mean is, what I mean is that in order to, to get to this object, science has, has you know, uh, made efforts for about three, four centuries now. So in this object, you, you have collapsed several histories and several important things and several powers and so on. So it's very difficult to, to switch from this object to something like really science or open science or whatever you call it. Right? Uh, so the three characteristics of this thing, according to me, are this. I'm going, to, I'm going to call this modern science. And you, you tell me if you agree or not. So you have an auto, individual collective, okay? It's certified because of peer review, and it's stable. It's published, and it's knowledge, which is which not stable. You can criticize it, but in the meantime, what what's the stamp? This paper here stays stable in libraries, a critical paper, right? Uh, is there anything else that's very important to that picture? I just want to backtrack. Um, I now increasingly get to like the value of peer review. I mean, I guess it's better than no review. Well, but this, is, this is the second part of the picture. Like you know how there was like recently, you know, someone created some AI program that basically, you know, manufactured these false papers and just sent them to all the major journals. A significant percentage of them got accepted. Yeah. So I have lost a great deal of faith. I'm not so sure. I mean, you're you're bad. Or let's do it. Yes. Most of all these controversies about the public here and how they publish it. All right. Harvest.
But this is why I'm trying to, to, to find the main, most important thing, most important reasons why this object is so important. Uh, not, because, not just because maybe not here, maybe not author, but like being accredited for something. So yeah, it's certified so, by kind of uh, it's, uh, it's recognized. It's, uh, but it's like the individual, the author, gets recognition. Yeah, it. yeah. So it's, it's, it's yeah, of course, yeah, this, this is going to be fine. So yeah. recognized author. Yeah. Uh, so what do you see here? Let's talk about I'm, I'm going to call it wiki science. So I can distribute uh, open whatever science. And what do we do here? Uh, I will start with uh, distributed authorship. Not yeah, so you can put it on the on the board because I can't read that. And oh yeah, so writing is really great. Um, <laughs> Okay, author no, certified right and stable. So the author is recognizable. It's certified and peer review and it's stable. It's a piece of paper that's published and it stays in libraries forever. So on the other side is distributed, so you don't really know who contributed what and who was more important. Yeah, it's also, I would say, on the other side. It wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. So, not that much. It's very like the top of the top row, or this is the new row. It's just a new column. This is like science for real technology. So, certified, you now have you know community approval. I would say, like in the new world, Rather than a certification, you have you can measure by usability. How many, how often is it actually being referenced again? Yeah. So like the, the, the way of the way, yes, the certify if knowledge is good or not are just exploding. You don't know how many people share them on Facebook. Maybe open peer review. Maybe uh, uh, whatever you can measure. Success. You know, you can you can correlate it to the number of successful experiments that have been referenced. But the so that article was reference. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What is yeah, yeah. Are we talking like science 2.0? Yeah. I don't, yeah. 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 Open, open to, as in, as in opening up access to information, not as, as in opening up boundaries to report people. Okay. 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 Okay.